Okay, I'm going to start with a verse in Luke chapter 17. And I'm sure you guys have all heard this verse many, many times. Luke 17, verse 20 says, And now, having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming, he, that is Jesus, answered them and said, The kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, Look here, here it is, or there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. And I think he was talking about himself. I'm in your midst. Huh? Mm -hmm. Now here's a problem. The King James says the kingdom of God is in you. Okay? Quite often when we're out doing evangelism, we run into this with New Age folks or, or people that have been, uh, maybe uh, they know just a few Bible verses, and of course this is one of them they know. The other <laughs> verse they know is, judge not least you be judged. They always know that one. <laughs> right? That's their favorite one. But this verse they usually know, but it's usually only out of the King James. And the reason they like to use it is because when we're confronting sin, doing evangelism, they'll, they'll think that we're judgmental and arrogant. And they'll say, well, the kingdom of God is in all of us, brother. But is that true? Jesus at times rebuked people and said, your father is the devil. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I run into this quite often, and quite often uh, Muslims will say the same thing. We, we believe in the same Jesus. No, we don't. I had a guy come out of a coffee shop here just a few weeks ago, and he saw the sign in the back of our truck that says, God created Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Yes. And he wanted to be, you know, run right out there and tell us, you know, we're on the same page. We believe the same thing. And I said, and he, and he was a black guy from Somalia, but he'd been here for a long time, so he spoke real good English. So there was not a communication problem. And uh, he says, yeah, we, we believe in the same thing. I said, you're, you're Muslim from Somalia? Yes, sir, he said. And I said, we don't believe in the same thing. Oh, yes, we do. I said, no, we don't. So then I began to take him apart. Because I know the Quran pretty well. I've been reading it for, for a long time. Okay, so these are some of the things you run into. Now, with that thought in mind, the age that we're in, we think, is the most evil age that there's ever been. And it's pretty corrupt, <laughs> without question. However, every, e every age has evil politicians. Remember Moses? He had to deal with who? Pharaoh, right? Jesus, who did he deal with? Herod, right? Read the little book of Esther. Who did they deal with? Haman. Haman was the right-hand man to the king, and he was corrupt as they get, right? And so our day and age isn't a whole lot different. The difference is we have technology and the ability to make things happen so much faster now. You know, the, the, the worst corrupt person is a highly educated person. You get somebody that's really smart, and if the devil gets hold of them, they can do a lot of damage. And then, if they're smart enough to know a few Bible verses, they're even worse. Huh? You run into folks who, uh, we're out doing evangelism, you often run into the Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, and Baha'i Faith, and everything else under the sun. And uh, the, the Mormons especially, over the past couple of decades, they've got to the point where they've polished their presentation to the point to where it sounds so much like what we present that if you don't know the truth behind you know, what they're about, you're not gonna know the difference. You know? And so when we confront that publicly, it really stirs things up. And uh, just to give you an idea, well, let me, let me read another verse here before we get uh, too far into this. In uh, Revelation chapter 21, uh, just in case you might think I'm being misled here, <laughs> in Revelation 21 says in verse 7 he who overcomes shall inherit these things and I will be his God and he will be my son for but for the, the cowards the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers 
and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, not just a few liars, all liars, okay, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So we have this sign that we hold out sometimes on the street, and it says lying politicians are going to go to hell. Okay? Now, that's what the Bible says, all liars. Huh? No problem. Okay? Now, now, Jesus oftentimes used language that can be a little offensive. Hmm? I mean, he called people a brood of vipers. He called them hypocrites. He called them dogs. He called one woman a dog. I mean, kind of offensive, you know? I mean, if I was to call somebody out here in this, in this church and say, you're, you're a dog. I mean, pastor would go, <coughs> hey, Brother Brown. <laughs> you know, that probably wouldn't go over very well. But when you're out in front of a Mormon temple and you have a sign like this, oh, beware of the Latter-day snakes, that gets things stirred up. But you know what? Jesus used that kind of language. Huh? Frightening. But it's true. Just a few weeks ago, we were over at a, uh, an open house of a Mormon temple in Pocatello, Idaho. And of course, they had uh, buses just poured into this place. I mean, just one right after the other. And of course, they, they have it set up to where these buses, they don't want all the people coming to the temple because there's not enough parking for everybody. So they have staging places, usually in Albertson's parking lots, because Albertson's and Safeway's now run by the Mormon church. So they use their parking lot as a staging area where they, they load people on the buses, and then they bring them up to the temple, and they, they dump them off on one side of the temple, run them through the temple presentation, and then they pick them up 40, you know, 40 minutes or a half hour later on the other side of the temple. Okay, so we were there with our signs with the Latter-day Snakes and here these people are coming off the bus. They didn't know what to do with us. And they couldn't get rid of us. But, you know, my thought is this. There's lots of young people that are raised in a particular religion or cult or philosophy or they've been brainwashed by the public school system and they're never going to know there's a problem unless somebody does what we do or somebody challenges them in some way or another because they're going to think everything is just normal and see um, here a few weeks ago uh, Peggy and I or no I guess it was just me and a couple of guys <laughs> I'm out on the corner of a, a very busy intersection next to a Starbucks we had our truck parked in a Starbucks parking lot and I wasn't sure how long that would last before they called the police and asked us to move it because on one side it says you know, God created Adam and Eve, not Adam and Stephen. On the flip side, it says, beware of Mormonism, Islam, Jehovah's Witnesses, Jesus is Lord at the bottom of big red letters. And sometimes if you park it in a, in a parking lot, it is one for the business people get together and they call the police and they want you out. It had that happen before. So anyway, I'm out of the, the, we've been on the street there for maybe 40, 45 minutes, uh, Dave and my other brother Dave. Uh, it's interesting, we've got a few people in our area now that are starting to get the vision, and they're starting to do the same thing that, that we do. It is, it's interesting, you know, to, and everybody has a little different approach. They use different kind of signs, and ultimately, they all point to Jesus. We all have different ways of doing that. There's the good cop, you know, Jesus loves you, and then there's the bad cop. You're going you're gonna to go to hell if you don't repent. That's the bad cop, okay? Well, we're, we're normally kind of the bad cop, okay? So... Here we are out on the corner, and lo and behold, uh, I see this little yellow Volkswagen come around the corner, and I'm on a traffic island, so there's a, a lane between me and the mainland, right? And I'm standing with, with my friend Dave, and I, I think I was, I forget what sign I had, I had a couple of them, and uh, this lady come around the corner, and she had her window down, and she's flipping me off and cussing at the top of her lungs, you know? And so I had a sign that said, uh, I think it said, it said, you must be born again on it. And I just pointed it at her and I followed her around the corner. And she's looking at it and flipping me off. And I just smiled and said, you need to be born again. 
Well, she spun around and parked next to my truck in the Starbucks parking lot. And she had her teenage daughter run out, and I had a couple of signs laying propped up against uh, some bushes just about 50 feet away from me. And she ran out and grabbed my two signs. And I thought, huh, had, we've had this happen before. So I knew what was going to happen. I was going to have to cut her off at the pass. So I crossed the lane, took off after her towards the, the vehicle, and I got to her just about the time she opened the door and shoved my signs in the passenger side of the Volkswagen. So I promptly shoved the door on the signs. The handles were still sticking out. And here they go, you know, they crunched them. And then I looked at her, I said, now what are you going to do? And she's looking at me, she starts cussing me. And this is a little gal, probably about 14 years old, 15 maybe, you know? And I'm thinking, her mother put her up to this. Now this is what you're dealing with. You know, it's not just the parents that are corrupt. They put their kids up to this kind of stuff. And, and of course, the devil knows too that we're not going to be too aggressive dealing with girls. I mean, guess what's going to happen? They're going to file assault charges against you. Right? So anyway, I grabbed my signs, and about that time, this real big guy came out of nowhere, with hair down the middle of his back, and he appears, steps in front of the two of us, in between us, and he turns to me and says, back off. And I went, yeah, no problem. Hey, she was just stealing my signs, dude. I'm just getting my signs back. He goes, okay, I got it. So I backed off, and then immediately, the mother in the vehicle gets out of the car, and she comes running at me like she's gonna, and she's a still little gal too, you know, I'm thinking, you know, you're not too smart, I'm not quite a bit bigger than you are, you know, and, but she's cussing me and going, you know, don't you touch my daughter, blah, 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 well, I continue to back off, and then this big guy goes over and gets in her face, tells her to get back in the car, so what else do you do, I just packed up my signs, went back to the traffic island, and stood out there with Dave and my other brother Dave, and within about <laughs> Within about three minutes, two police cars come flying into the parking lot there, and, and I watch them, you know, and I'm just continuing with my business, and, and we're getting a lot of thumbs up. The Christians, you know, they're kind of going, wow, this is cool, you know, these guys are bold for Jesus, you know. And of course, the other side of the society, uh, the, the blasphemers, they're flipping us off and yelling at us, and calling us racist, bigots, blah, 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 you know, the whole list. And then I watched the police for a while, and eventually they, they, I watched them interview the guy with the long hair that had stepped between us. He hung around, praise God for that. And then the police officers, they, they went over and they interviewed these two women. They talked to him for the longest time. Then eventually one of them comes and talks to me. He says, uh, so it's my understanding that these gals are trying to steal your signs? I said, yep. He says, well, we have this guy over here who's writing out a statement on your behalf. And he says, so that's a good thing. You have a witness. But he says, you know, these gals are wanting to press charges for assault. And I said, really? That's, so that's where they're going to go with this? He goes, yeah, unfortunately, that's what, they're, that's what they're writing down. And I said, well, I, I could have slapped her, you know. <laughs> that's what I felt like doing. But I didn't. I just pushed her back and I grabbed my signs, right? So he says, so what do you want to do? I said, well, I want to press charges too for theft. <laughs> they're stealing my signs, you know. I mean, it's not a big deal, but still, it's the principle, right? So uh, he says, okay, hold on, I'll be back. I'll bring, bring back his clipboard. He's got the form that I have to fill out and have to write out a statement. And then he says to my, ask my friend Dave, he says, so you want to fill out a, a witness, a form as, as a character witness? I said, he says, yeah, sure. So he writes it out, and then he reads it to me. He says, that's not about right. I said, well, that's what happened. So anyway... Uh, to make a long story short, about four or five days later, I get a call from this police officer, a real nice guy, and I think he may have been a Christian. He didn't say that, and normally they don't tell you that. They don't want to take sides. You know, they try to stay neutral. But uh, you, you could tell he was trying to give me the benefit of the doubt on everything, you know, so I'm, you know, praise God for that. So anyway, a few days later, he calls me, and, and he says, I just want to let you know that uh, the, the case that the young gal had filed against you for assault? And I said, yep. He says, ah, that was thrown out. He says, so you're good. I said, praise God for that. And uh, he says, so we're going to continue the, uh, the charges that you've brought, though. I said, well, that's good. You know, maybe she'll learn something. He says, we can only hope. You know? And, and sometimes 
you know, oftentimes we as Christians, we just want to turn the other cheek and let everything go. But sometimes people need to be held accountable. You know, there has to be a little pushback, right? Now, Dennis mentioned a principle uh, a few minutes ago that I want to read it. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. And this is Apostle Paul. And he says, verse 1, this is the third time I'm coming to you, and every fact is to be confirmed by the testimony of two or three witnesses. That's kind of the judicial principle that our government is founded upon, right? I have previously said, when present the second time, and though now absent, I say in advance to those who have sinned in the past, and to all the rest as well, that if I come again, I will not spare anyone. Wow. That's kind of harsh language. Well, of course, what he's, what he's making reference to is, in the first letter of the Corinthians, there was some issues that he had to confront. One was uh, some, some sin in the camp that the church wasn't dealing with, right? So this is what he's alluding to here, okay? Since you are seeking for proof of the Christ who speaks in me, who is not weak toward, toward you, but mighty in you, for indeed he was crucified because of weakness, Yet he lives because of the power of God. And for we also are weak in him, aren't we? We're weak. Yet we shall live with him because of the power of God directed towards you. And then he says, test yourself to see if you're in the faith. Now this is kind of early in the service to be having an altar call. But this is a test. We're going to have a test right now. Examine yourselves. Or do you not know or recognize this about yourself that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you fail the test? Remember we read that verse in Luke? Um, the kingdom of God is what? He's not really in you unless you fail the test. I mean, if you fail the test, he's not in you. Right? So, and the reason I bring that up is because Mormons... Uh, in Doctrine and Covenants, chapter 130, in, uh, this is one of the scriptures of the Mormons, uh, it says this, the idea that the Father and the Son dwell in a man's heart is an old sectarian notion and is false. Huh? And usually, if you press Mormons on this, I like to ask them, is Jesus Christ in you? And usually what they say is, oh no, he's at the right hand of the Father. Huh? Okay, well, that's partially true. But see, it's only half of the story. Because Jesus is omnipresent, right? He's part of the Trinity. And of course, they got the whole idea of the Trinity all mixed up. Okay? They, they can't wrap their mind on the idea that they're all one. Okay, well, one simplistic way of looking at it is man is created in God's image. He is triune. He's He's physical, he's spirit, soul, and body. And you can't separate those three parts and still be a living human being, right? Well, the same thing applies for the Godhead, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He is triune, okay? Of course, Muslims have a hard time with that. And nearly all of the cults, they attack the deity or the triune nature of the Godhead in one form or another. So if you're going to get out and start doing evangelism, you kind of have to understand some of these things because that's what you're going to run up against. Okay? When they say, oh, brother, you're awful judgmental. Well, and they quote, you know, out of uh, Matthew chapter 7, judge not least you be judged. You have to go read that, read the rest of the chapter, and you'll find out that it goes on to say, beware of false prophets. Huh? So how do, you, how do you not make a judgment and still be aware, you know, be you know, cautious of false prophets. So obviously, the context is really important. Okay, so go with me to um, uh, 19th chapter of Acts. This is Apostle Paul. And he is down in Ephesus. I'm not going to read the whole chapter because there's an awful lot of stuff in here. Boy, there's a million rabbit trails we could go off on. I'm going to start in... Verse 23, where it says, And about that time there arose no small disturbance concerning the way. 
Well, when you hold up a sign that says, be a hoe no more, there will be a disturbance. Okay? Now, I've had, I've had good meaning Christian folks say, well, brother, you know, that's, why don't you just go, why don't you just quote the scripture which says, sin no more. Go and sin no more. I said, well, I like this one because there's a woman evangelist, her and her husband, that do evangelism on university campuses. And she has shirts that are made up with this message on it. And they get hundreds of young people come to listen to them speak. So oftentimes we have to use the language of the people we're talking to. Okay? And so when you say, be a ho no mo, these young people know exactly what you're talking about. Right. Huh? There's, it's kind of funny. And it, but it, it'll give them something to think about for a long time. Huh? And then, of course, you flip it around and says, uh, there's no abortions in hell. Right? So these two messages kind of go together. So we can flip it around and get the full meal deal. So Paul says there's arose no small disturbance concerning the way. And of course, who's the way? Jesus is the way, right? And that's, of course, what they're presenting here is the way to God. And Jesus is the way. Right? Verse 24 says, A certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, was bringing no little business to the craftsmen. Now keep in mind, uh, I think the King James says Diana here instead of Artemis. Okay. And the reason for that is sometimes the translators they stayed with either the, the Latin version of the, the word or they would use the Greek version of the word. Okay, So the, most, most of the modern translations use Artemis. Okay, Well, who was Artemis? Artemis, there was a huge temple in Ephesus. The temple to Diana or Artemis, whichever you want to call her. Okay, And, and Artemis was the daughter of Zeus. Huh? So Paul was aware of the cults of his day, okay? When he first started out, he dealt mostly with religious Jewish folks. And of course, he knew all their traditions. He knew the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians. He knew all their issues. And so whenever he got into a discussion, he would play off of those issues oftentimes in conversation, okay? And so that's often what we have to do. When you're in a place like Pocatello, which is, uh, you know, probably 20 or 30 percent Mormon, of course, your, your mission field is mostly Mormons, okay? Or people that are employed by Mormons or something. They're influenced in one way or another by the Mormons, okay? So if you go there and you don't address that issue, you're kind of missing the point, okay? When we went to the temple here a few weeks ago, we thought, well, and we tried to rally some evangelists to get over there with us. And sometimes that happens. And we get people that are like-minded and they show up and it's great, you know. But we got over there and, and we thought, well, there's a, I won't mention what kind of church it was, but it was a real big church only a half a mile or so from the temple. And we thought, well, let's stop there and see if the pastor has anybody in his congregation that's going to be doing any kind of outreach during this event. Because there's going to be thousands of people come to this temple thing, right? So that's your mission field. Well, we stopped and talked to this pastor, and it looked like at one time it must have, you know, had a congregation of, you know, a thousand people or something like that. And, and we got conf conflicting numbers. We talked to a lady at, the, at their little Christian school there, and she said, well, we got about 800. And then she changed her tune a little bit later. She said, well, maybe four or 500. And, and then later, the pastor came down and talked to us. And I asked him, I said, so how many people go to your church? Well, he says, I think about 150. So they didn't seem to be on the same page about how many people went to their church. But apparently their church had just gone through a, some kind of split, and he was trying to patch things up. He'd only been there for about a year, and so lots of internal issues going on in the church. And so, see, the devil had neutralized them. for As far as doing outreach, they weren't equipped to do anything because the church was a mess. And that's oftentimes what you run into. You know, the church is so dysfunctional because the devil has caused infighting or he's got sin within the camp or whatever. And so the church has been neutralized, okay? And quite often, 
we have people get involved with us just a few weeks ago we had a young couple started coming out holding signs with us and they've only been saved for just a few years so uh my buddy dave he was really excited about that and i said eh, just just be cautious here you know they're young christians and this could backfire on us you know and uh, of course at the top of their one of their signs says you know be rapture ready you know what kind of message is that to put on your evangelistic sign you know, the only people that know anything about a rapture is Christian folks. And you're out talking about being rapture ready. Non-safe non -safe people just think that's nuts. You know, at least present Jesus, you know. So, but anyway, so fast forward a few weeks, and eventually what happened was this couple got upset because of the signs that Peggy and I carry. And they said, that's not the gospel. All you do is offend people. And I went, okay. And I tried reasoning with them, but it was useless. Eventually, they just quit showing up. They, they like the Jesus, you know, that blesses the little children, but they don't like the Jesus that confronts sin and calls people out. So, God is love, no doubt about that. Jesus is love, no doubt about that. However, woe to you, Capernaum, if the miracles had occurred in you that occurred in Sodom, or it had occurred in Sodom that occurred in you, they would have repented in sackcloth and ash, Jesus said. His last statement to Capernaum was, this whole town's going to hell. Wow. I mean, talk about kicking the dust off. Okay? But if you say that kind of thing today, you're a hater, you bigot. What's wrong with you? Huh? So here Paul is. He's in Ephesus. Verse uh, 25 these he gathered together with the workmen of similar trades, the silversmith, and said, Men, you know that our prosperity depends upon this business. Did you know that having a Mormon temple in your town is a very prosperous thing? Because all kinds of people come there to do temple work. Huh? So you go there and you disrupt the business, the Mormon businesses, they want to, they're going to come after you in one way or another. They want to get rid of you. Shut up! You know? He says, verse 26, And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a considerable number of people, saying that the gods made with hands are no gods at all. Oh, no. Poor people. He, he hurt their feelings because he made fun of their gods. And not only is there danger that this trade of ours fall into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis, or Diana, be regarded as worthless, and that she, whom all of Asia, that the world worship, that all the world worships, should be dethroned from her magnificence. And when they heard this, they were filled with rage. And they began, began crying out, saying, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Yeah. What do we hear today? You go to a Muslim community and you start challenging, you're going to hear, Allah Akbar! Allah Akbar! Huh? That's what they're going to be hollering. How do I know? I've been to a few of these places. Now you get out in front of a, in front of a mosque and you start saying, Jesus is Lord, Muhammad is not. i got a big sign that says that. And you get them stirred up. Hmm? Well, they need to be stirred up because they're in error. The only way they're going to be know the truth is somebody presents it to them. So, verse 29, and the city was filled with confusion. Okay, now, how many times when things like this fly apart, you hear accusations from the Christian folks, God's not a God of confusion, brother. All you're doing is causing confusion. Well, Paul, what are you doing causing confusion here? Huh? When you confront sin, it causes a stir. Verse 29, the city was filled with confusion. They rushed with one accord into the theater, dragging along Gaius and uh, Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. And when Paul wanted to go into the assembly, the disciples would not let him in. And also some of the Asiarchs, folks from Asia, who, this is, you know, this is not China we're talking about here. We're talking about Mediterranean Asia, right? Asia Minor? Uh, and some of the Asiarchs who were with, uh, with his friends 
sent to him and repeated, urge, repeated urging him not to venture into the theater. So then, some were shouting one thing and some another, for the assembly was in confusion. Don't cause confusion, Apostle Paul, you brother. That's not being nice. And the majority did not know for what the cause they'd even come together. And that's quite often the way it is. There'll be a bunch of people that come together and they're mad at you, but they don't even know why. Because they get caught up, you know, in the liberal agenda. Right? And uh, I sent out a little clip, a little video clip to a bunch of people on our email after I had the little incident with the, the young gals. And uh, my, my uh, statement uh, that I sent along with it was, when stupid girls do stupid things. <laughs> and I got a reply back from an elder of a church that we used to go to. Nice enough guy. However, he's a school teacher. So he's been programmed to where you don't say certain, certain words, right? In school, there's certain things you can't say. You can't call somebody stupid. So that's the standard by which he judges and filters all of his, his Bible reading. So he sent me several emails trying to set me straight. He says, you know, obviously you don't love people to call them stupid. And so I wrote him back and I said, well, Jesus was incarnate love. And he called people a brood of vipers, whitewashed tombs, you know, sons of the devil. And he even said he was going to send them to hell. I said, I'm going to stay with him. You know, you can say what the school agenda and their program but I'm not going there because the school system, the public school system is corrupt, you know? And, and, if, and if you're a school teacher, I, I have empathy for you because you're in a system to where your, your hands are somewhat tied. You know, you have to work within the confines of the rules they give you and it's tough, but I'm not there. So don't try to lay it on me, okay? So you gotta be careful. Now, this guy, he means well, and God uses him, you know, in his, his situation, undoubtedly. But he doesn't realize that he's been brainwashed. And that's exactly what it is. So, here we are, verse 33. And some of the crowd concluded it was Alexander, since the Jews had put him forward, and having motioned with his hands, Alexander was intending to make a defense to the assembly. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, a single outcry arose from them as to what they were shouting about for two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Now, after quieting the multitudes, the town clerk said, men of Ephesus, what man, what man is there, after all, that does not know that the city of Ephesus is a guardian of the temple of the great Artemis, of the image which fell down from heaven? Think about this for a second. One-fifth of the world's population are Muslims. In Mecca, in the Kaaba, in the cube, that's, a, that's Arabic word for cube, Kaaba, in one corner of that is a stone, a meteor stone that fell from heaven. And they've been worshiping that thing long before Muhammad showed up on the scene. Right? Okay. Well, apparently that's what happened here. There was something that, maybe a meteor, who knows? I mean, I don't know all the history behind it. There's probably a million different stories because cults have a million different stories as to how they, they got started. And it's kind of hard to pin them down sometimes. But in this case, something had, had come down from heaven and convinced them that it was God. Okay? Well, um, this guy, he's trying to neutralize the situation because he knows there's going to be a riot. Right? Verse 36, Since then, these things are undeniable facts. You ought to keep calm and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of our goddess. Now here's another issue. The King James here says robbers of, if you have a King James, it says churches. Okay? That's actually a problem because churches is not the problem here. It's a temple. It's a temple of Diana's. So it's a mistranslation thing here. 
okay? And every once in a while in the King James, you'll find these little things. They're not really an issue regarding who Jesus is. You know, they don't have a doctrinal uh, problem. They don't create a doctrinal problem for us, but they create linguistic problems for us. And so when you're dealing with people who are skeptical about the Bible and critical of the Bible, they point to these kind of things and say, you see, your Bible's not reliable. Okay? Well, the Bible is totally reliable. It's just that the translators sometimes were maybe influenced by, they just didn't think about it. They thought, well, you know, temples or churches are where people worship, so that was called a church. Well, it wasn't really a church, it was a temple. Okay? So then, if Demetrius and the craftsmen who were with him have a complaint against any man, the courts are in session and proconsuls are available. Let them bring charges against one another. And that's kind of the position the police officer was in regarding us and these young gals, you know. He was trying to diffuse the situation and trying to present to these, these gals that you guys don't have a case here. They have First Amendment rights. They have religious freedom here for a while. And so they can stand out here with a sign and you have to leave them alone. You can't you would tear up their signs, right? But that wasn't enough. So they tried to press charges on us. Okay, so what's changed? Nothing, really. We got the same devil that's been around for, you know, eons. So, verse 39, but if you want, want anything beyond this, it shall be settled in a lawful assembly. For indeed, we're in danger of being accused of a riot in connection with today's affair, since there's no real cause for it, and in this connection, we shall be unable to account for this disorderly gathering. We're all going to end up in trouble, is what he said. So shut up. You know, if you guys have a problem, take it to the courts. Because just having a riot, like the Antifa folks think they could do, you know, that doesn't solve anything. And after saying this, he did dismiss the assembly. So... That's the world we live in. And we have an obligation as Christians to be public about our faith. I mean, it's all great to come together and pray and worship, get equipped, but the battle actually is, is out there. That's where it is. And uh, you never know what you're gonna run into. Uh, just a few days ago, um, Peggy and I and a couple guys were out doing this sort of thing and uh, this elderly guy drives up in a truck and he watches for the longest time and then he gets out and he wanders down to where I was standing and I had the sign about corrupt politicians and <laughs> he says, you know, that, that sign is really needed today. And he was just a real nice guy, real soft-spoken. Uh, he looked to be an old guy, about like me, right? <laughs> And he says, you know, I was raised Lutheran. And he says, you know, I, after I left home, he says, now I went to church all the time with my parents and stuff. But after I left home, he says, I, I kind of fell away from it. And then he says, uh, sometime later, uh, my wife died. And he says, I had a come to Jesus moment. But he says, you know, I'm not a very social kind of guy. He says, I'm not really much for going to big meetings and large people, so crowds of people and churches and stuff. But he says, I really appreciate what you guys are doing out here. And he says, you know, I've been, been reading books by Josh McDowell. And he went down a list of books that he'd been reading that, you know, equip people on how reliable the Bible is and different things. And I went, praise God. So, you know, you never know where people are at. And sometimes we, we think that all we're doing is getting people stirred up. But there's occasionally somebody is really being ministered to and they're really being encouraged by what we do uh, years ago we had a van that simply said trust Jesus on the front of it and uh, I'd gone to a church one day on Bainbridge Island and uh, this guy came up to me a friend of mine that goes there he said hey I want to introduce you to this to somebody I said okay and he introduces me to an elderly gal that he says you know she comes up to me you own that van and I said yeah she said and she tears coming down her face and she says you know a few days ago she, he, she says I was having a rough day and I came to this intersection and she says I was just broken I was praying to God Lord what am I going to do and I look across the intersection and it says trust Jesus 
That's all it took. That made her day. See, so you never know, you know, what, what you're dealing with. So we appreciate you guys praying for us. We we get out and stir things up as long as we're uh, healthy enough to do it. And God uh, continues to use us. Uh, we put together a lot of videos now. A lot of our videos that we put up on YouTube and Facebook and different places, they've they've put algorithms targeting a lot of our stuff. So we used to get hundreds and hundreds of views, and now we get maybe a dozen. So we begin to use a lot of other platforms. So the devil is very clever in how he tries to shut down the voice of the church. But so far, we're still able to hold up a sign, you know, that addresses things that says you must be born again. You can't get much simpler than that. But then you flip it around, it says, beware of Islam, Mormons, and the Watchtower, because they're cults, you know? And uh, a lot of people that are involved in those, they find that very offensive. Well, they should be offensive, because they're lying about my Jesus. And to me, I, I think we should be offended, you know? When somebody says that Jesus is the devil's brother, sorry, I, I have to say something. That, that offends me, okay? And occasionally you run into Christians and say, uh, we just want to talk about Jesus. We don't want to talk about anything else. Okay, but what Jesus are we talking about here? Right? So, praise God. We thank, you know, thank you for inviting us to share. And uh, like I said, we appreciate your prayers. And you guys, we've known a lot of you for a lot of years. And it's been, it's been a fun road. We've been through highs and lows. We've all got our battles that we deal with. And now that we're getting the, over 60 is not so nifty, they say. Huh? <laughs> So we, we're all having some physical issues, a lot of us. And so, praise God, we, as long as we can, we can still encourage the weak and pray for the weak and uh, be a support of them. So, thank you, Fred, for inviting us. Praise the Lord. Thank you for coming. Amen. Thank you.